We continue our lesson in chapter 7 and we are in section 1.3 about the Inca society and government. Now to give you a refresher about what we covered so far, in lesson 1.1 we learned about the pre-Inca cultures. So these are the group of people that existed before this famous Inca civilization in the Peruvian region. And these cultures or civilizations are the Moches, the Wari, the Nazca, and the Sican. So each of this civilization contributed to the development of what we know today as the Inca society. And today, we will learn about their social structures and government. Go ahead, have your textbooks ready or go to our Loda USD website. And from there, launch Clever and from Clever, Cengage Learning with your student account and password. And from the left side, it's Unit 3, American Civilizations, Chapter 7, South and North American Civilizations, Section 1, and Lesson 3, or pages 181, or 180 to 181. This chapter's essential question is, in what ways do civilizations adapt to the environments in which they live? And the objective of this lesson is to examine the Inca Empire in South America. Again, this lesson describes how Inca adapted to the mountainous environment and built a complex civilization and empire. About at the same time as the Aztec emerged in Mesoamerica, the Inca began their conquest of Western South America. So in AD 1200, the Inca were one of the many small states occupying the Orabamba or Urabamba Valley, uh, high in the Andes Mountains of present-day Peru. So in 1440, the Inca ruled the region as an empire. Their leader by the name Pachacuti expanded the empire rapidly. And the meaning of his word is he who changed the world. So he is indeed a world changer. Um, he is very ambitious and he conquered and ruled widespread areas through a powerful military and strong central government. Now, a strong central government is very important as an empire expands. Cusco is the center of the Inca Empire. It is a stone city uh, with a population of more than 100,000. So the, in the Inca Empire stretched 2,600 miles from present-day Colombia to Argentina. And this means that they are governing about 12 million people who spoke more than 20 languages. That's why Inca is considered an empire. So despite its size, the Inca Empire was well organized. The hierarchy of the Inca society helped rulers maintain tight control of a large empire which is very important just like every great empire they have this what we call hierarchy so the emperor at the top with absolute power and below him are four regional officials called prefects and uh, they oversee provincial governors district officers and local chiefs so they also have some kind of supervisors uh, which supervise about 10 families and each help carry out the policies of the emperor. So the Inca government viewed the empire subjects as a resource like gold or timber. It demanded the whole populations uh, relocate if the state needed their labors elsewhere so they can you know, be dispatched uh, to work anytime. Commoners farm communal land and work on state-owned farms while also serving in the army or on building projects. So in order to manage the many details involving uh, in running the empire, the Inca also had a large bureaucracy or system of state officials. In fact, for about 10,000 Inca, there were about 1,331 administrators. So these administrators kept detailed records about all parts of the empire from population to farm animals to, to trade. So in other words, that is a very organized, detailed, oriented system of government. Let's take a look at the timeline of the empire from 1400s to 1532. 
As you can see from the top, uh, in 1400, the Inca lived in Urabamba Valley and they began their expansion around 1400. And by 1470, the Inca had reached the coast and extended their power northward into the present-day Ecuador. And by 1500, the Inca had expanded as far south as present-day Chile. They united their vast empire using more than 14,000 miles of roads. That is impressive. They are like the Romans. In 1532, the Inca reached the eastern slope of the Andes. And in the 1530s, uh, the Inca empire included more than 300,000 square miles and 12 million people. So if you will look at the map here, the white line represents Inca roads and the maroon uh, present day boundaries and the star codes uh, present day capital city and the black dots uh, other cities, major cities. Bottom line, this is a huge empire. So they are very far from what was described to them previously by many European, uh, European conquistadors as savages. This is an empire. This is an organized system of government, just like the Roman Empire. Okay, so what else? So like other civilizations, the Inca Empire was built on agriculture um, in order for them to be able to expand and explore, you know, other artistic endeavors, as they say, you have to secure the basic needs first. Now, because the Inca lived in a mountainous uh, region, uh, they made up for the lack of flat farmland with a type of farming called terrace farming. This is not unique to them. The Chinese did this and other civilizations as well who are living in mountainous region. So they cut flat steps or terraces on the sides of the mountains and built stone walls to keep the terraces in place so that it will not slide. So terrace farming produced potatoes, maize, and quinoa, a high protein grain native to the Andes. So in addition to farming, the Inca raised llamas and alpacas uh, for meat and wool and for transporting goods and people across the mountains. Just like other civilization, Inca are very religious. So they have rituals uh, centered to the need of, you know, good harvest and uh, be able to win wars, uh, things like that. So the Inca worship their emperor as the son of Inti, the sun god. So they're like the Egyptians and believe the emperor help humans to communicate with the gods. Now, before we answer the review and assess questions, let's uh, take a look at Math's interview, a National Geographic explorer who went to the Andes Mountain to study uh, the Inca civilization and his personal experience as a National Geographic explorer and what are the challenges and the rewards um, he got from this work. Hi, my name is Matt Piscatelli, and I'm an archaeologist and researcher at the Field Museum in Chicago. I study the role of religion in the development of early civilizations. So Matt, what made you want to be an archaeologist? When I was a child, I had a love for museums and a passion for history. I always wanted to learn more about people who came before us, and I had a love for travel. And I want to explore and experience new cultures to see different parts of the world. What took you to South America? South America is a really unique landscape and a lot of questions that historians and archaeologists are trying to actively answer or have answered in other parts of the world haven't been answered yet for South America. So there was still a lot to be learned and explored. So Matt, what have you learned in your research? I've learned that even in today's, or despite today's secular society, religion and religious thoughts and ideas and rituals played an important role in the development of early civilizations. Tell us a little bit more about what you were doing in the Andes. What were you studying? When I was in Peru, I studied some of the earliest ceremonial architecture in the New World. I studied, in particular, 5,000-year-old temples and the activities or rituals that they performed, or ancient people performed, 
in those temples. What kind of rituals were you finding? Using a variety of modern scientific techniques, we were able to discover that people would burn agricultural products, things like corn and squash, on the floors of temple structures as offerings to their gods. So Matt, why is it important to study world history? It's important to study world history, not to sound cliche, but to learn from our past mistakes and successes and to help us deal with the problems of today and to plan for the future. Matt, what can world history tell us that teaches us something about the future? Um, from world history, we can look how people in the past preserved and dealt with their environment, how they organized their societies, how they dealt with interactions between different peoples, and the hopes of learning from their successes and their mistakes to help us plan for the future. Great. Matt, what's the hardest part of your job? The hardest part of my job as an archaeologist is when I travel and I go into the field, I'm separated from family and friends, and there's sometimes a certain loneliness being away from loved ones from weeks to months on end. There's also a certain loneliness, not necessarily just in not being around them, but being in a different culture, a different cultural context. Sometimes jokes and complex thoughts, even though I know the language, don't always relate to other people. So not having that, that humor can sometimes be difficult. Matt, when you go to the field, what's the one thing you would never leave home without? Matt, when you go to the field, what's the one thing you would never leave home without? When I'm traveling, the one thing I could never leave home without is peanut butter, which is like ironic because I work in an area of the world where peanuts were domesticated, and I can't seem to find it anywhere. Peanuts were originally domesticated in South America, and we find evidence of their use and consumption going back thousands of years. And how did they make it into our jars in the United States? I really have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what does it mean to you to be a citizen of the world? Being a citizen of the world carries with it a, a certain responsibility to be understanding of other cultures and to realize that you have responsibility to engage in others in an understanding way and to go out and be a positive role model for other citizens. Okay, now let's go to the review and assess questions. And for number one, reading check, how did Pachacuti unify and control the Inca Empire? And number two, analyze cause and effect. What method did the Inca use to farm in the Andes Mountains? And number three, interpret maps. What physical features limited eastward and westward expansion of the Inca Empire? Okay, go ahead, go to our Google Classroom and open the review and assess assignment and go to the second slide, which is lesson 1.3 and answer those questions. Well, of course, you have to put the last name, first name, class period, and things like that. And the key vocab here is terrace farming. And don't forget the title. And obviously, aiming for a full credit, you have to give the correct answers in complete sentences and using your own words. So that is our lesson for today, Chapter 7, Section 1.3, Inca Society and Government.